Hi, welcome to the 10th episode of Coding with Amadeus. I just finished the last feature of the Smart Mirror, the real-time transit updates. And instead of walking you through it line by line, I thought I'll just show you the highlights, and there are quite a few. In this episode, I would like to go over a few areas where I deviated from the original plan, specifically why I'm using HTTP client instead of web request, which I have shown in episode 8, and why I'm not using observable collection in a transit model as I planned in episode 5. On top of that, I'll touch on using converters for XAML bindings in universal apps and show a refactoring feature in Visual Studio 15. Let's take a look at the transit model underscore translink, which is an implementation of transit model which is specific to my city. Here in a constructor, we're reading the API key and the routes I'm interested in from the settings controller, which reads the settings from a JSON file. We implemented that in the last episode. So going back to the HTTP issue, we have this uh, web request uh, from episode number eight, and let's see how it was happening here. I specify the content type to be JSON, and looking at the API reference of my transit agency, they say that as long as I provide uh, the accept header or content type header as application JSON, they'll give me a JSON response. And here we see that the data that we're receiving is XML. What makes this problem even more weird is that the very same code in regular.NET, for example, in a console application, works just fine. We're getting JSON response. So I felt an issue on the .NET's GitHub, and David here explained what's happening. The Translink API supports an incorrect request. According to the HTTP standard, a GET request should not have a content type, because it doesn't have any content type. And this is why the core FX, which is the .NET implementation used by universal apps, dropped this header, because it's invalid. So now, not only will we be using the accept header instead of the content type header, we'll be using the HTTP client class, because this is the recommended way of HTTP communication. The web request is here only for uh, legacy reasons, so that the old code doesn't break. And uh, we can see that the web request required us to use the stream reader and HTTP client doesn't, which is uh, always a nice and welcome change. So let's take a look at this code and we'll see that the message that we're receiving is in JSON format. There it is, JSON. So disregard what I said in episode eight, you should be using the system.net.http HTTP client for the communication. Back in episode 5, I laid out plans that we would use the iObservable collection in a model to relay the information about the bus arrival times to the view model, and the view model would use also iObservable collection to relay this information to the view. But this is too much iObservable collection. It made the code really difficult to use and read. It was simply an overkill. So let's think about why do we need to use iObservable collection in the first place. We're doing it for the view, so that the view can update just the one item or the few items that changed instead of changing everything. Suppose that we have a view model which sends i annual rule to the view. Then the view has to remove all of the elements and then create them again. And this is bad for two reasons. The first of them is visual. If you have an animation played when an element is introduced to the collection, then the view would replay them for every single element. And from the performance point of view, uh, it's very costly to create elements because you can do it only on a UI thread and it just involves lots of calculation to create graphics. So instead, we'll store the i enumerable in a model and then the view model will be the entity which figures out which item actually changed and it will relay this information to the view so that on change of a model we're changing only one thing in the view model and the view updates accordingly. So let's take a look at the code. Actually let's not look at it too much because there's a lot of complicated code and it's not really fun but if you have any questions about it 
shoot me a message at Twitter and uh, I'll get back to you. So we have an, uh, we're in a transit view model and we have the observable collection of lines and whenever we have a change coming from the model we are taking the one line from the observable collection of lines and then we are working with that line. Since we are in this method, let's take a look at this for each loop. I'm trying to remove elements from a collection while I'm iterating over this collection. And traditionally it's impossible to do it because removing an element from a collection you're iterating over causes an exception. Uh, so here we have the collection line to update dot arrivals and instead of operating on this collection I'm operating on a copy of it. The toList method offered by link takes a copy of a collection and puts it in a list. In order to update a specific element in an observable collection, I needed a sound way to find this element. I have this uh, transit line that comes from the model, and I'm trying to find a transit line view model. And a good way to get a match is by comparing the arrival time. And uh, here is also where I deviated from the episode 5. In episode 5, we're storing arrival time as a string. Um, my rationale was this is a view model and the view model should just provide data to the view. So the view model will pre-format the time to the hour colon minutes format and just ship this information to the view. And that's where I was mistaken. Actually here in this view model, I need to use the date time because I need to do the comparison. Now the issue is that if we send the date time to the XAML, it will just take a two string and display the complete date with the year, month, day, and seconds. We don't want that. So what can we do in this case? We use a converter. How do you write a XAML converter? I just take a converter from my old project and uh, copy it over because there's just so much boilerplate code. For just a few lines of logic, there's uh, 40 lines of boilerplate. So uh, I took my old converter and I copied it over here to the Universal Windows app only to see that there's a lot of errors. Actually not a lot, just two errors. Uh, we can see that the iValue converter is no longer accessible. What happened? Uh, just hit control dot and you'll see that it's just under different namespace. It's under Windows UI XAML data. So we can remove the system Windows data. And another thing that changed is that uh, in classical.net, the converter takes culture info as a parameter from the system globalization. And the universal apps, uh, this is a string language. So here's a subtle change to the converter. And another change is in a XAML file itself. Uh, let me show you how you use a converter. This text block will display arrival time for the bus. We're using the binding with path arrival time, which is reading the arrival time property from the view model. And since this property is a date time now, I'm using a converter which will input this date time, work over it, and output the string that I want. So the converter is uh, taking the proper two string of the date time. The converter is a static resource. To make it a static resource, I had to create the section page.resources where I said that I want to take the date time to short string converter, which is the literal class name for the converter, and give it a key, date time converter. Now everywhere throughout the XAML file, I can use this key, date time converter, to access this so that we don't need to type uh, the namespace and class again. And speaking of the namespace, back in uh, classical.net, if we're using a namespace in XAML, in this line, we define that uh, XML namespace name converters will be CLR namespace, I know why, and here is the actual namespace. Now in uh, Universal Windows apps, 
we're also saying XML namespace converters equals, but now we have a much more friendly using statement. And there is very last thing I would like to show you, the refactoring in Visual Studio 15. Let's quickly take a look at the app. To recap, in a transit feature, I'm displaying the time when the bus will arrive to the bus stop. So for example, 7.55. And the number above shows when I need to leave my apartment to actually make that bus. So for this bus, I need to leave it now. Uh, for this bus, I need to leave in one minute. For this bus, in six minutes. And here's the bus that I should have left three minutes ago. And actually, every single minute, I'm updating the times on this screen. And if any of the buses um, I should have left for it over three minutes ago, I just remove it completely. Which means that in the view model, I have two locations where I'm using uh, what's known as magic number. Magic number is minus three. And it's called magic number because there isn't really much context to it and we can make the situation better by refactoring this minus three. And Visual Studio makes refactoring easy. Let's uh, select the minus three and now hit control dot on the keyboard. And this gives us a few options. Introduce constant for minus three, introduce local constant for minus three, and here introduce constant for all occurrences of minus three. So in this way, with one click, we will uh, take care of every single minus three in this particular file. So we're introduced constant here. And now as we're doing it, we're already in a rename mode. So now we can give more context to it. And as this is a constant, I'm using a convention that constants are all uppercase and have underscores. Bus cutoff. We have this bus cutoff. And now in the code, instead of having minus three, you have uh, something which is more meaningful. Now you need to change the minus three only in one place. You don't need to worry about updating it in multiple places in the code. You just change it here. And I think that actually minus one would be more suitable. So that's it for today. Uh, try to use control dot for various things and see what Visual Studio has to offer. And now that we have finished all the features, in the next episode, I would love to take a look at handling exceptions. We'll talk about the try catch blocks. And since we have no real input output on our device, I'll use application insights to send the exception information up to the cloud. I'll see you next time.